I felt very safe. I feel safer than I felt in the U.S. lately, I have to say. Um, just walking around, going places. Like, I, I'm traveling on my own. Uh, I can go anywhere and be perfectly fine. And just in general, it is an extremely beautiful country. It has nature, and I feel like it's so underrated. So good to be back here in El Salvador after uh, spending a couple months in California, and I'm extra excited about uh, today's show. I didn't realize that you were actually the inventor of Lil Hodler, but now we have uh, Lena with us from originally from Germany. Germany. Okay. Yes. A long way from home. So the funny thing is, I, I'm not somebody who buys things at conferences or anything like that, but... My wife went to Miami with us, uh, I think it was two years ago, and she saw those and she's like, we should get those for the kids. And I'm like, our kids are 14 and 16. They're not going to want a little plushy, you know, toy. And she's like, no, they'll love them. And she was definitely right. Like the kids love them. So <laughs> it's uh, they're going to be excited when I tell them that that I got to sit down with the uh, creative mind behind this Um yeah, you'd be surprised. Like even a grown adult men like them, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> now people buy it for their kids. They buy it for their dogs too, for their cats. I would I would feel themselves. bad giving it to the dog because it would tear it up for sure. But they do. They do. <laughs> you make them with the squeaky toy inside. Yeah, we were thinking about it. We were thinking uh, you, about you it. Maybe should one do day. that. I bet. I bet people would. People love spending money on their dogs, so I think they would totally buy that those. That's actually true. Uh, <laughs> now I'm so glad to be here. I had no idea my vacation would lead to this. <laughs> well, I was surprised to hear that your first time in El Salvador because uh, I know I saw a picture on the internet uh, a year or two ago with you and President Bukele. So. I thought you were, uh, you know, a frequent flyer here. So. <laughs> that was actually not in El Salvador. But since that time, I was like, I actually, I have to come, right? So that time we met, that was in Istanbul. Okay. So I kind of like, I owed it to him to actually come see his country for once. And it took me a long time, but now I'm here. Do we have a picture of that, Andy? Yeah. I uh, I remember seeing that on, on Twitter, I think. And uh, it's so funny to have you here with us now, so. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was completely bizarre to me too, but you know, it was kind of like. So just out of the blue, you just you ran into the president, or how, <laughs> how did this uh, come about? Almost, yeah. No, I was so th this is in Istanbul on a boat. Ironically, um, I so I was staying in Istanbul at the time, and I actually had um, messaged him on Twitter before, so. He followed me because I was doing some content, some comics on El Salvador and somebody brought it to his attention and then he followed me. And so I, I messaged him and I, I pitched some kind of um, documentary to him that was yeah, th three months before that picture. And like he never replied, which I like I was not surprised. He's busy why running the he... country. So. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> Why would he care about documentary? Like, yeah. So three months later. He um, DM'd me back and he said, um, you're in Istanbul, right? I'm coming. Um, I want a hodler. <laughs> so he came and um, I had I actually had one hodler with me in Istanbul. It was very early on in um, my yeah, in the, the little hodler journey. And I only had a few prototypes and that was the only one I had in Istanbul. So I saved it and then I brought it. And yeah, so I. I I went on a boat there. He had like an event on the boat and I, I went, I brought the hodler and I got the photo. <laughs> so I see he did not convince them to adopt uh, Bitcoin as legal tender while he was there. I remember that was the, the rumors. Everybody was hoping that uh, that they would uh, yeah, I asked escape him. their horrible fiat that they have there. And uh, Yeah, I asked, he said, um, yeah, I don't think Erdogan is going to go for it. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, but I, I I did ask, but I don't think that he actually talked about it with him. No. And so I, you actually got yeah. to spend some time with him, right? Like after, yeah. after this, or you guys sat down and chatted for a while? You said? Yeah, and like that is probably never going to happen to me again with any other politician or like I'm probably never going to meet another president, but um, he is incredibly approachable. So just the fact, right, that he messaged me and asked me to bring him a hodler, which I don't bring any political value to you, right? Yeah. So that I, I still cannot believe it, but... Um, yeah, so we um, so there was like a there was this thing on the boat. There was a dinner, and uh, after that, we actually we had a coffee for like two three hours. We were just sitting having coffee and talking, and that. So what what were you guys talking about <laughs> for all that time? Was it uh, Bitcoin or the country or just the... yeah, just like I mean, what would you ask a president, right? Like how what's it like running a country, right? <laughs> like like um, I just. I remember from the conversation, I felt a lot of common sense from him. I felt that he's extremely sharp and that he's running the country rationally, which is unfortunately not something you can say of everyone or even many leaders in the world right now, where I felt that he's extremely aware of, um, you know, when you make a certain decision, a certain political decision you have trade-offs but you try to you try to weigh these against each other you try to pick the best option try to do things the best you can with the the cards you are dealt and um, he also talked about the 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 bitcoin plans and he said you know like somebody has to, to start it right i don't know where this is going to lead long term but i want to i want to give this opportunity i want to start it so i felt that he's very aware He's not like out there and like saying, oh, yeah, we're like we're bringing Bitcoin everywhere now. And like he, he was not like that. He was very aware of what he's doing. And yeah, it just I did not expect that much common sense, which, you know, I don't know what that says about me or about politicians in general. But it gave me personally a lot of confidence. Um, yeah. So that's really my takeaway from the conversation with him. What what did you sense was the main motivation for, you know, adopting Bitcoin as legal tender? Did you get any sense of if he saw this as, you know, helping reshape the narrative about El Salvador, if it was more about, you know, bringing financial inclusion to, to those who've been excluded or bringing business to the country? Or I don't know if you guys got into the specifics of those things, but yeah, just curious yeah. as to what, what you thought was yeah. the main driver. Yeah, so I don't want to like uh, li put put words in his mouth, right? And it's yeah. been it's been a little while, and I don't remember all the details of it. But um, I I do remember that he was extremely impressed with the Bitcoin Beach project, and he wanted to give that a shot. Like it felt logical to him, so it felt like the the logical next step for that project was to take it to the national level and give it a go and give people an option. It was not about forcing something onto the population, but about um, having an option for people to choose an alternative, which is, you know, it, it's kind of symbolic for a lot of things he does, isn't it? Just kind of finding finding alternatives to what is often well, what is often imposed on you by um, by 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 certain organizations in this world. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't want to tell us who you're talking about i, I guess we can let the oh uh, like the imf yeah. like the world bank yeah. like um the, the u.s U government like the u.s government like <laughs> yeah. no he's and i think he's seen that all these failed policies that keep being repeated mm -hmm. are obviously not bringing prosperity to the country and so he's willing to do something different and you know i think a lot of times people are like oh but you know bitcoin started at bitcoin beach and now it's become this government thing it's like well yes we had a very small project here and it's and, you know obviously love being a part of it but we weren't taking any risk this was something we're doing in a small community he really put his neck on the line by bringing the whole country along and i i think it's why he's going to go down in the history books and people will remember him as the first person who had the courage to do that but that's much different than implementing it in a small community to roll it out nationwide. 
And you are challenging authority. You are challenging a world order with that. That is no small feat. And the way he's handling it, from what I can see, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it takes something, right? Because obviously, um, countries like the U.S. Um, organizations like the IMF, they don't like you going against their standards. They don't like you doing your own thing. They don't like you trying to get independent. So I am not surprised at all to see the narratives are shaping in media, in the US, in the EU, like in, in, in my part of the world where I'm from. Um, people have a very negative image of, of, um, of Nayib Bukele and of El Salvador in general, just because of the, the way the narrative is shaped by the media. And it seems like an almost desperate attempt to me, because if you look beyond that, you see there is an agenda. And that is something that he has to deal with on top of trying to reform an entire country, yeah. right? And I think, well, the media is doing him dirty. These organizations are doing him dirty. And uh, the, the work he's doing, obviously, it's, you can never make everyone happy. You can never do everything perfectly. And um, I don't want to sound like a government shill or whatever. You know, <laughs> I'm just like, the things that I'm seeing, I, I wouldn't know how I could do better. And I don't like how in the media, generalizing this now, in these in, in the media like that, it sounds as if, you know, Oh, he should do it differently. But how? <laughs> like, what should he be doing? I haven't yeah, seen. They never. Any they never have an explanation for yeah. that. It's. It's always just. You know, it's always easy to criticize somebody, but mm -hmm. he's. He's taken on very complicated things with you know trying to end the the entrenched gang problem here mm -hmm. and tackling all these different things. They're they're messy and but he's he's not backing down. I mean, even with the Bitcoin thing, that was my fear as the Bitcoin price went, you know, started going down after they adopted that, you know, typical politician would like, you know, turn around and, and go the other direction and mm. pretend like, oh, well, we didn't really mean that. And instead, he just doubled down like, no, this is a long term. We're in this for the long term. He understood the long term advantage that would bring to the country. Um, and how it would help reshape the country. And so yeah. that is pretty rare for a politician to be willing to, you know, stand their guns on something that, you know, even within the country initially wasn't very popular. And, you know, I think over time, the population is realizing all the benefits that are coming. There's still, you know, some that that's, don't see that. But in general, I think people are realizing, no, he put El Salvador on the map. He said, we're open for business. We're transforming the way we do things. And so it's bringing jobs and prosperity. And um, yeah, that's the impression I got, too. So um, I'm, I'm getting a lot of cynical comments this week because I'm posting all these photos. I'm just posting them. Normally, this would just go on my Instagram because I think people on Twitter don't care much for vacation photos, but I know they care so much about El Salvador. So I'm just posting it there. I'm getting a lot of cynical comments of people like, oh, like you're promoting El Salvador, but nobody's using Bitcoin. Like, and I, I think it misses the point big time. So uh, when I talked to locals here, they were all aware of it, whether they use it every day or not. Um, that's at this point, I don't think you can expect everyone to use it for their daily purchases or whatnot. Um, the, the, the effect this has had is, as you said, it put El Salvador on the map. Pretty sure it brought loads of investments. It brought um, new people into the country and it brought a lot of attention and it brought awareness and it gave an option. It gave an option to use Bitcoin, which is amazing. Like we we cannot expect an entire country to start just start using Bitcoin and now everybody's only using Bitcoin every day. Like I think that's a bit utopian. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you look, they went from one of the countries with one of the lowest Bitcoin usage to one of the countries with the highest and definitely the most mm -hmm. awareness. I mean, you won't meet anybody in El Salvador who doesn't know what Bitcoin is. Yeah. And so there's very few countries that, that you can say that about. And so how you took this you know, country that was considered kind of a backwater and made it something that people are actually concerned about now that, you know, El Salvador is on the map. People are you know, a lot of times being critical of it, but that shows that it's actually important. Mm. And it's it's been interesting because I think in the last six months, 
you've seen even some in the in the media start to like hedge their bets as far as their negativity, especially as the the bonds in El Salvador have been the best performing bonds, I think, in the world this past year, mm. as people have started to realize, no, actually, it's not uh, it wasn't a mistake to adopt Bitcoin. It's actually you know, fomenting this economic miracle in El Salvador as the economy here is booming while the rest of the world kind of grinds to stand still. The economy here is booming. People are excited about it. And so I feel like people are starting to come around. They're, they're definitely still going to be anti, but they're saying, well, maybe the economy is doing well, but what about this? And so now you do all these these <laughs> what ifs. And even the, the U.S. ambassador um, the new U.S. ambassador, they they replaced the ambassador, I think, in this last year. And he's come out with a lot of positive comments about how the economy is doing well, that the illegal immigration from El Salvador to the U.S. is like half what it was before because people now feel like they can make a future for themselves here. So he was even being pretty positive, which is unusual because the prior ambassador was very negative about everything here. So mm -hmm. it's been, I feel like even people in the world are starting to come around and they can't ignore what's happening here. Yeah, exactly. And I cannot remember. So just for some context, like I've, I, I, I travel a lot. I spent the last nine, 10 years just traveling places. And so I've had the privilege of seeing quite a few countries and I, cannot remember a sentiment like this anywhere. Normally, like many, most places in the world you go, people are unsatisfied with their government. People are unsatisfied with the way their economy is going, and especially the last couple of years. Yeah. Generally, people are just saying, eh, like, it's not that great. It used to be better. There's an optimism here that I've never seen before. Like, you really feel the country, there there's a reform going on like there's development happening and that you know that is because of the new government you cannot um deny that and uh yeah as you say like <laughs> at some point you can't ignore what's happening and with all the criticism you give which i think um nothing's ever perfect right and i wouldn't know how to do things perfectly and i don't think it's possible but People aren't giving this government the benefit of the doubt. They're saying, oh, um, but something could happen or but something could go in a bad direction. And it's good to be cautious, good to be aware. But you should afford someone, you know, the, you should afford them the benefit of the doubt, which it's not getting, at least from the outside. Yeah. Because once you're here, you know, the, the sentiment is very different from over in Germany, let's say, for example. <laughs> so this being your first time in El Salvador, mm -hmm. has it been what you expected? What's What's been different? What's just kind of been your overall mm -hmm. take since landing? Yeah, so I have to say, even though I know um, that the media is, like, has an agenda, even though I know that what is being said is, um, you know, there's there's a motive behind it. And even though I've I've been around a lot, it did affect me a little bit. So I did feel it subconsciously. But first, when I first got here, um, I did wonder like, mm, is it is it unsafe maybe? Or am I like, could I get in trouble? But I have to say, from my experience so far, I felt very safe. I feel safer than I felt in the US lately, I have to say. Um, just walking around, going places. Like I, I'm traveling on my own. Uh, I can go anywhere and be perfectly fine. And just in general, it is an extremely beautiful country. It has nature and I feel like it's so underrated. So I went to places, um, for example, I went to this old, I'm really interested in history and all that. And I went to this old Mayan um, archeological site where you have a few of them here, right? Where I think if I went somewhere in Mexico, it would be crowded. Yeah. Here, I went, I, it's uh, in San Andres. Mm -hmm. I went there, there was nobody. I was the only person there. I felt like, how, how is nobody looking at this? It's amazing. I feel like this country is extremely underrated and it's gonna change, most likely. I heard it's already changing. So my, my local friends here, they told me this. Um, a lot more tourists lately, and it's a lot more crowded. It's, it's, it's getting a lot busier, which is great. But in general, I feel like it's so underappreciated. 
and it feels like a like you kind of you have some sort of cheat code to a beautiful country that has not yet been discovered by all the Instagram influencers when you go around here. Like we went to um, Ataco, which is like west, close to Guatemala. Yeah, kind of coffee country, higher altitude. Oh, it's beautiful. The weather there is amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. And it's colorful. It is a colorful country that I, I'm just like, I'm just taken away. There is a sort of rawness in the way a lot of the nature is untouched and it's just you have mountains you have jungles then you have the beach right here you have volcanoes you have waterfalls and and everything's um, they're all within like an hour of each other you yeah. can be on top of a volcano and then you know an hour and a half later be walking on the beach yeah i like that actually i like a small country big countries are very i don't know it's intimidating like when i was in los angeles i wanted to walk from one place to the other and i very quickly realized that's not a good idea <laughs> Here it's very it's very easy to get around too. That's another thing. Like I somehow had no idea there was Uber here. Like I that that is such a stupid uh, misconception I had that I couldn't use Uber here, just because in other places I've been there was no Uber. But it like it's it's very easy to get around. Um, people are extremely nice, extremely nice. So for example, I um, so I I know the ambassador of El Salvador to Singapore and um, I met him because I went to Singapore earlier this year and I met him there and I told him I might go to El Salvador later this year and he was like super excited he's like yeah I mean he's the ambassador right but yeah. in general <laughs> um, Salvadorian people are very excited when you come which is awesome and uh, he told me yeah my sister is there like um, just hit her up and she can tell you the places to go so I did that I messaged her and said look you're, you're your brother said I should message you. You can tell me the best places to to visit. And then she said, she said, yeah, um, I'll take you around. And then this week she has been making time almost every day, taking me to places, showing me the local ways, answering all my questions, and just being extremely hospitable. And like that's like I I have rarely seen that so welcoming. And uh, yeah, that's my personal experience, right? But I can like I'm I'm just. So it's more than I expected. I actually don't know what I was expecting, but it's it's amazing. And you have a, an aura here, like you have, you you feel a kind of freedom, a kind of optimism here that is very rare lately. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Did you and like you mentioned, you felt safe the whole time? Mm. As people always like, to, oh, El Salvador is a dictatorship, and uh, did you? sense any of that you feel like you have to watch what you say or? <laughs> no no yeah. no i i i had one yesterday i went to el bocaron that that national park which is like is very close to san salvador at the top right? of the volcano there yeah, yeah yeah so i looked it up before um looked up a guide on like how to get around and i read in the guide that the the people who were hiking there they they came across some aggressive stray dogs and they warned the like hikers to like be a bit careful. So I messaged my friend and I asked her like, should I be worried about this, about the stray dogs? And she laughed. She's like, you're worried about stray dogs? Like at least like, you know, yeah, we have stray dogs everywhere, but at least we don't have gang members every anymore. <laughs> so like she's like, that is the level of like worry that you have is like that as a stray dog or whatever, like, which by the way, they were like, the dogs were all friendly. Yeah. I did go and they were very nice. Um, I, so yes, I, f I feel very safe. Like I, the, I don't know what it was like before. Like I've just heard from, from my friends here, but when I hear what it used to be like that when they grew up, they went to school and then they came straight home. They couldn't go out at night. Um, she told me, you know, walking around with your phone, um, it made you a target. Go in. People used to take two phones with them. They'd bring like an old phone, and like their <laughs> dummy phone to give if they got robbed and they'd have their good phone like hidden. Yeah. Yeah. And like she said, you know, go in for a run and maybe like your branded like Nike um, shirt or whatever. It made you a target. Um, like I, that's something that I cannot even fathom um, where we take a lot of things for granted if we we don't grow up in, in in like an environment like that. Whereas now, like you could not tell this was ever the case. 
it feels just like any other place. It, nobody's worried from what I can tell, like walking around, um, like how they're dressed or what they're carrying around. It's just, it's just, it's just a place. Yeah. It's just a place with beautiful nature. That is an amazing feat. Like how do you like that? I, I yeah, I, that's, it's crazy. <laughs> You're speechless. Yeah, I am. Even even when things were were bad, the people were still amazing. Like that's something that I hasn't bet. changed. The mm -hmm. the people have always been amazingly friendly. But it is just kind of freeing now that you don't have to worry. Like if you turn down a wrong street, or you know, if you're out past dark. I mean, there used to be places that if we couldn't leave before you know the sunset, we would just stay where we were because we were afraid to drive through certain areas. And wow. so that's just totally changed. Now I'll go anywhere, any time of the day or night, and not really be worried about it so and even if you get lost there's always helpful people to you know to oh, help yeah. you out oh so. yeah i got stuck up at el Bocaron yesterday because um so i went there by uber and then i noticed i had no no reception up there <laughs> and then i i asked somebody and he helped me to uh like get me their internet and um, um people, people were extremely extremely nice even if you have maybe a language barrier it's, it's actually not an issue like in some places where maybe uh, people can't like english is not that widely spoken then people tend to avoid tourists because they're uncomfortable talking to them it's not a case here at all like, the communication is not an issue yeah 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 people are very patient even if you have broken spanish they're, they're happy, to, <laughs> happy to talk to you um so did you stay in the city at all or where have you been staying since you've been here yeah i've been staying in san salvador okay and um now that i i mean i only just came down to el zante right i was in el tunco earlier it's my you, first you, time i down mean here. you're missing out this is the you know you yeah. save the best for last i guess yeah yeah so now i know probably next time i should stay somewhere around here because it's beautiful yeah. And the, like, just generally, there's a lot of construction going on here, right? And you see, there's a lot happening, and it's happening fast, I think. And I mean, that's amazing to see. Like, if you want to go somewhere where things are happening, where things are growing, I feel like here you get the vibes. Here you you get, as I said, optimism. Yeah. 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 Five, ten years ago, there was, I mean, unemployment was was off the charts. It was very much a struggle for, you know, people to even find work. And not that there's not still poverty and not that there's not a long way the country still has to go to bring wages up. But now the main complaint you hear from businesses is like, oh, we can't find enough employees because we had somebody, but they got a better offer somewhere else. And so, which you love to see, like things are booming and, and people are hopeful about the future. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's amazing. That And it's rare. Um, so when are you going to move here? soon <laughs> well I, I i am actually open to the idea like seriously i think so not to over romanticize it you probably have to learn spanish i would probably have to learn spanish um but aside from that for my personal priorities everybody has their priorities right what they need in a place for me the most important thing is a sense of freedom i don't like um a government meddling with everything I do all the time. It's part of the reason why I moved away from Germany as early as I did. It just felt very controlled. Um, for some people, that's great. If you like everything orderly and regulated, which is the German way, it's perfectly fine, but it's just not for me. Um, I, I, like, I, like a I like a free home. I like when you can, you know, live your life and you don't have somebody looking over your shoulder all the time, which unfortunately is happening more and more in more places in the world. And here I do feel you have that paired with awesome weather, awesome nature, really good food, really good food. <laughs> and uh, So you've had yeah. some pupusas, I take it? Um, yeah. Oh, and I oh, I had like, um, I, I, I had that and I had like a, hen dish i think up in a taco they had they said like the local thing here is you eat the hen with like a yeah ga, yeah plato de gallina or something mm. i say yeah yeah <laughs> so and it's just it's the kind of food that you eat and afterwards you feel good so it's like it makes you it makes you feel healthy even if that is also good and i had a lot of guacamole too um, I, don't, I don't know if that's actually, that's probably not even Salvadorian, but they make it like, very well here. <laughs> yeah, no, they eat a lot of avocados here. So. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So, uh, food so how, is a big how does it compare like the, the overall sense of things? You mm. know, you, I think you're living in Turkey now. Yeah. Lately, Istanbul. Is, is, do you sense a difference just in like the people's outlook on life? I know Turkey has been uh-huh. through a lot of struggles recently. It could not be more different. Right. So yeah, unfortunately the people in Turkey, they're great, but they are suffering from their economic and political situation. Um, so when I first came to Turkey, it was October, 2021. And just to give you perspective at that time, the exchange rate from the dollar to the lira was, it was already like inflation was already rampant. It was $1 to nine lira within a month. It went to 15. And now, last I checked before I left, it was 25. And that is just the exchange rate. So paired with that, you have... um, So it was just like two weeks ago that from one day to the other, like literally overnight, they increased a bunch of taxes. They increased a bunch of um, fees, uh, like visa application fees and some administrative fees, like partially doubled the fees made things more expensive so just things happen very quickly in a and in in a in a in a bad way um i think when you look at the statistics the official inflation rate is something like 70 percent, but that's nonsense so just look at the exchange rate dollar to lira in addition to that then everything's getting more expensive in general uh, housing is getting how housing prices are just mad. What happened really? to that? Yeah. I would think people would be trying to leave and sell and get out, but they're they're just trying to buy physical assets and Well, what and is they're losing a lot of talent. So a lot of people who can't afford it um and are in a position to, they are moving elsewhere. You do notice that. A lot of people just cannot. And then also, and you gotta commend them for that. It they Turkish people are very proud and they can they should be. Their country has so much culture and history, like literally in that part of the world is where our civilized um, culture started, right? They have like, the, uh, just Istanbul alone is beautiful. Architecture is beautiful. Um, yeah, but unfortunately, um, life is is getting harder there. So you have inflation going crazy. Then they up the minimum wage, but it never matches the actual inflation. Actual prices. Exactly, exactly. So I know a lot of Bitcoiners had hoped that, that Turkey would be one of the places that <laughs> that adopt Bitcoin. I'm I'm assuming uh, you don't share that view, or what? What are your thoughts on that? Do you well, think that <laughs> could you see the government there adopting Bitcoin, or or maybe it's just the citizens increasingly moving into Bitcoin, realizing that it's a you know yeah a much better place to to park their wealth. Yeah, government won't adopt it. Not as long as they say they're waging a war on Bitcoin, which are they still? That's still the it's the same the guy. Okay. Yeah, it's the same guy. Um, so Bitcoin is not illegal in Turkey. Actually, during the last bull market, Turkey was the largest, the second largest market in the world, and the largest in Europe, um, because adoption from the ground up is massive and. Like every like people are very, very aware of it. It's just payments are prohibited. Right? So it's illegal to pay. Uh, make so you can Bitcoin. own Bitcoin, but you can't buy something in Bitcoin. Yes, yes. Um, however, so for example, if you go to the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, you'll have these little corner shops. They look like exchanges, like currency exchanges, but they sell Bitcoin and then they sell oh, really? Tether and some other. Yeah, yeah. And some of them alts. Um, and these make millions in volume every day apparently there is so much demand for it obviously right like people buying bitcoin just to to store their wealth or are people being paid in bitcoin for working overseas and they're exchanging well officially nobody is getting paid in bitcoin right (laughs) Um, yeah so people are trying to not hold lira simple right so there's a lot of government programs where they're trying to make you hold lira with very weird promises which shows you how how desperate they are but generally everybody's trying to get out of the lira so the dollar is the most popular way to store your wealth which says a lot about the situation with the currency um and then gold obviously is a big one but gold is not that convenient right so bitcoin has a big opening and bitcoin is very popular although i do have to say 
Um, also, a lot of these like sketchy projects where like get rich quick scheme coins are also very popular and generally. I mean, it's it's kind of a pattern you see in countries that struggle economically that these um, that all coins tend to be yeah. used They're like by leeches. The, they follow anywhere that they yeah. see Bitcoin making inroads and they yeah, yeah. they try to ride in on the coattails. Yeah, and but Bitcoin is the one that sticks that yeah. stays around, right? And it's um, to me it was very interesting because when you go to the cinema, you have um, you have Bitcoin promotion like commercials for exchanges and uh, everywhere throughout the city. There's billboards. Bitcoin is very present and. Apparently, they don't care that there's billboards and that there's Bitcoin companies and, and all that happening. As long as you don't use it for yeah, payment. Yeah, and this is my personal guess, but I think they are aware that a lot of this is helping to prop up the economy. Because if just with what is happening in the economy, it, it shouldn't, like the country should look much different than it does. So if you go to Turkey, it's not like it doesn't, there's not piles of cash on the street, like like what we've seen, not not yet, at least, like not what we've seen in from Venezuela, for example. Um, it looks like normal life, but people are struggling. The divide is getting bigger and people are just trying to make ends meet. And yeah, so to bring it back to the original question, the it could not be more different, the sentiment you feel uh, from, you know, what I've been seeing here in, in El Salvador. So when I first got to Turkey, I talked to some of the younger people um, that told me, like, I would love to study abroad, but it's just not like I cannot afford it. It is just not uh, you, you cannot like it's just not yeah. possible. <laughs> it's just not possible. So you seek for for opportunities within the country and you try to, you know, do the best with with what you have. But if you're dealing with a government that is actively actively wrecking your economy like what do you do right so that is kind of the situation in turkey which is a massive opening for bitcoin which is why bitcoin is huge there yeah well maybe it's setting the stage for it i feel like all the inept politicians that kind of ran el salvador down set the stage for bukele to come in and and make these big changes so yeah maybe in the future we'll see the same thing in, in turkey hopefully it would be great yeah yeah. Have you have you spent any Bitcoin in El Salvador? What's been your experience with with yeah, I, using Bitcoin? I have here and there, although I have to say I didn't like I'm not actively running around and like saying like to everybody, hey, do you accept Bitcoin and whatnot? I don't know if I should, but I'm just kinda like enjoying my time yeah. here. Um Yeah, but I but I have here and there and I do feel um so just talking to people they're like, yeah, Bitcoin is is accepted here. We don't use it that often, but we know it's there. So this is like the the very like the, the very realistic open view of it, right? So they're not using it every, every day, but they know it's there. And they um, so a lot of them claimed their initial Bitcoin gift that they got, and they got them in touch with Bitcoin. Which is cool. So my friend said her her aunt and her grandma actually claimed the Bitcoin, and then they got interested in Bitcoin. So that's pretty cool. And I think that is more than you could even hope for. I mean that that's an amazing awareness campaign. Just well, Bitcoin. and I think when we have the next you know bull cycle, these change. people have this in the back of their mind, and you know humans. That's just human nature. When you see something doing well. You want to be part of it, but they'll have the tools to to get in during this next cycle. Yeah. So I think you're going to see a huge wave of adoption in the next up cycle. And I'm not one to to focus on price. I, you know, that's not what's important to me. But I do understand that it's a driver to get people interested. And so I yeah. think in this next cycle, people are going to be shocked by the the level of adoption here. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it's always like that, right? The bull market bull market brings the people. But here they have the rails for it. It's going to be very easy for them to access it. And yeah, I'm actually, I'm really excited to see that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get back to talking about y what you're doing and your <laughs> company. And I didn't realize, I had no idea. This is like your full-time thing. Like you're selling uh, plushies. Plushies. <laughs> you have your, your comics that are widely read. Um I know you do special things for companies at times. So yeah, tell tell people about your business. I think people will be 
very intrigued that that this thing that you know started well first share why it started why you decided to do it rather than you know posting things on twitter <laughs> I, I love that angle of it <laughs> yeah no it's um so i started it in 2020 so it was during the time most countries were going into lockdown uh, at the time i was um living in in taiwan and i was i, I remember like because so I remember the day I posted the first comic because at the time I was I was running the Bitcoin space and um, running my Twitter account and, you know, doing what you do. But I did not like it because um, so I like I I like harmony and Bitcoin Twitter is <laughs> they can get very toxic at times. And um, that was very stressful for me. So I knew if you want to grow your account if you want engagement and all that, you need to post controversial takes. So I did that um, and it did work. But whenever I tweeted something, I just put my phone away because I, I was scared to open it and people would be like fighting me or like, and that's just like, it was not fun. And that time um, I had an idea for a tweet and I thought like, I can actually, it makes more sense to put this in a picture than into a written tweet and i just did that i did it very like rudimentary on powerpoint like very basic with like stock photos and i i actually sat on it i looked at it for like um like i looked at it and then i came back two hours later and i looked at it again i was like what if people don't like it like what if they what if somebody like gets mad again like yeah i'm, I'm like that it's horrible but then i posted it anyway and it became, um, at the time, it was my most liked tweet. Like, it was just, it met some kind of demand. And that's how I started. And do you remember what that one was about? Oh, yeah, it was. Uh, so 2020 was, it was right, it was July. So it was right after that crash in March 2020, where it crashed from 6000 to $3,000 in, in like a day. And then it went back up. And around the time, it was like eight dollars $9,000. And it was hovering there. Like all of 2019, it was hovering there. And then 2020, it like dipped and then back up and then it was hovering. And we knew because the halving was about to happen or had just happened. We knew it's just a matter of time for it to go to 10,000 and then from there go beyond, right? So we had this um, over 9,000 meme going on, right? So there was this anticipation, kind of similar to what you feel lately where people are like, it's about time, it's about yeah. time, you know? So I did a comic <clears throat> about a little hodler um, going through the bear market starting in 2017 with the crash, uh, then 2018 walking through fire and like swimming with sharks and just like suffering. And at the end, he meets a little note corner and Bitcoin's over 10,000 and the note corner is like, oh, you're so lucky you get in under 10,000. So that was that. And yeah, so I started and then from that, I started making more comics. And yeah, apparently that, like that was a niche that I found there because those they became very they became very popular, and it had the the very nice side effect for me that people don't really argue um, with comics that much. So it's a lot less. It's it's more wholesome, you know. Yeah. I kind of I kind I kind of shaped a little wholesome. They niche. felt a little silly getting mad about you know some plushy hodler drawing yeah the, you'd be yeah. surprised it still happens but it happens less yeah. <laughs> so i can handle it now so i've kind of like i found a little wholesome space in in on bitcoin twitter that i can occupy so i can still get my message out i can still do my work but i don't have to um i don't have to be toxic which i obviously i see the value in that but it's just not my character so i kind of found my own little niche and um yeah i found other people who appreciate that and generally, it just happened that people liked the comics and they shared them, um, probably like shared them on their messengers, shared them with other people. And that's how it spread. And so that's how it got like the character got known. It's a very simple character. Right. Um, and so I. Well, and how did that go from this idea of doing this comic to, to being the way you make your living? Like that's, uh, <laughs> that's yeah. fascinating to think that this could have launched you on that path yeah i just made a plushie actually i made one prototype plushie of the little hodler uh, which is basically like this little one but without the without the bukila accessories <laughs> um and i posted it on twitter 
because I like it was just the thought. I made it. I wanted it for myself, and I posted it, and I said, you know, look, if I if I made more of these, would you buy it? And from that point on, people just it's like they were asking me every day, like, are you gonna make? Can I get one? Can I get one? And then I I made an initial run. So how many did you make the first run? I think I made 500 the first okay. time. Yeah. And um, so you had to do all this research about how to have you uh, know, plushies manufactured. Yeah, don't and... remind me. <laughs> if I had known before <laughs> what goes into uh, putting together a business for um, e-commerce with actual physical products, plushies and all that, I, I, I don't know if I would have done it. But luckily, I didn't know like finding the right supplier, getting the design done. I have a I have a little cemetery of prototypes that will never see the light of day because they look scary. <laughs> um yeah, but so I I did that. It took about half a year and then we had the initial run of plushies just in time for Christmas. Um and I I made my little store and I put it online and then people crashed the site actually really which is another thing i hadn't thought about that the server could yeah overload um that's yeah, a good problem to have though. that's a great problem to have yeah and uh, they sold out and they sold out and then i ran into the next problem that i had chosen a very bad fulfillment service that lost a quarter like lost 25 percent of my orders just lost them in transit and never to be seen again um which was also very stressful, which at that point, then I, I discovered that Bitcoiners are probably the best customers you can have. People would think Bitcoiners are the worst customers because they don't want to spend money because they'd rather buy Bitcoin. But um, so when we ran into the issues where de where deliveries were getting delayed, I was apologizing to people. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm so sorry. And then people were like, no, it's, it's fine. I have low time preference <laughs> where I felt they really want to support young Bitcoin startups. And that is something that I've felt ever since. And I continue to notice in our space is that we lift each other up and that we forgive each other, you know, initial mistakes and we, we help each other rather than, uh, you know, rather than trampling on each other and like always complaining about all the little things that go wrong. Yeah. And um, I actually managed to fix the warehouse issue because then I found a Bitcoin fulfillment service provider who um, based li literally like a fulfillment a warehouse run by Bitcoiners uh, working for Bitcoin brands. And they said, look, we can do it for you. Um, they're also based in Germany. It's easy for me because I'm, I'm German. Um, and then we started working with them. And since then, it's been it's been amazing. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of steps involved. Right. But then from there, we had new products, um, started making more comics. We started selling special editions, like basically, you know, that look a little different, that are wearing a bunch of stuff um, for different conferences and different Bitcoin brands. And now we have collectors. So we have people who literally travel to the conferences to get special editions. Really? Yeah. And they they line them up at home and then they take pictures. I have people who have more um, special editions than I so do. So how, how many different editions are there? I think we're at like 30 something by now. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was it got kicked off because um, Bitcoin Magazine for Miami, I, I think that conference- Probably that the year that, that I bought two of them. I think so, yeah. So Bitcoin Magazine was the first to order a special edition and the timing was great. It was just before um, the bear market. So there was still enough interest um, for me to gain a lot of attention. Did uh, they sell out during the conference? They sold out. Really? Yeah, yeah. I think they had a thousand of them and they wow. sold out. Yeah. That, I mean, um, that's pretty amazing because um, I think that year, I think there was only like 8,000 people at the conference that year. Do you um, remember how many oh, with I, the tennis? Or was that the bigger year? I, that was the bigger okay. year. Yeah, so, I think they had so, like 25,000. But still, they had 25,000. That means like 4% of the you know people bought yeah, one yeah. of your plushies, which is huge for something that you wouldn't necessarily associate with bitcoin yeah so. yeah and it's just you know there's it's a plushie right yeah. it's, it's kind of random and if well when I, my wife told me we should buy some for our kids i was like <laughs> come on but they they absolutely love them so yeah and it's something probably if i had made a business plan before and like pitched it to someone and said i'm gonna make bitcoin plushies they would have been like what like bitcoin is those are like i don't know 90 percent men grown men why would they buy a plushie but um, luckily, that's what, that's what I would have thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but luckily I I 
did no such thing. I just like blindly went into it. And uh, yeah, kind of, yeah, kind of struck gold with that. I kind of just found my niche. And from there, thanks to, you know, Bitcoin Magazine's exposure, lots of other conferences came, then brands came. Now I'm starting to do animations, which is like the nat natural evolution, I would say. So like companies will hire you to like, hey, do an animation for our, pr our product or how does that work? Yeah, so like I always, like the first thing I do is I do it for the brand, right? So I'm doing, I'm working on animations, like short animations, just similar to the comics, but animated. I'm working on longer ones too, because I kind of want to fix the offering of, um, you know, Bitcoin explainers on YouTube. Because a lot of them are still very PowerPointy, and I just kind of want to add something new yeah. there. Um, well, and this feels very approachable, very yeah. like because sometimes people get like, "Oh, it's Bitcoin. I'm not a technical person. I can't understand it." But when you see a little yeah. comic, it helps uh, that I'm not a technical person, so it will never get too technical in the comics. Yeah, um, yeah. So I do these things, and um, then if there's like an opportunity to work with a brand where it makes sense for a conference or um, like just just a brand that's aligned with you know what I do then sometimes I will do uh, commissions like I've done I was in Oslo a couple of weeks ago for the Human Rights Foundation mm -hmm. the Freedom Forum and we did um, some like you know uh, censorship resistance themed comics and I did a, a big piece for them um that you know we i don't know what they did with it actually but i told them they could use it for an auction because we've done a lot of pieces where they went you know they were auctioned off so those kinds of things i started doing i, I just kind of do what is needed <laughs> like somebody asked me can you do this then i see can i do it and if i can then i do it and uh, yeah that's kind of well, it's so funny, and this this thing led to you meeting the president of uh, El Salvador. Who would have thought that? Who would have thought? Yeah, the little plushie <laughs> would would open that. that the little door, door opener. Yeah. yeah, yeah, crazy. I, I mean, I'm not complaining. It's also, yeah, it's the same thing. Like, why, what? Like, I don't have any political value to add, you know, or any. Yeah, I, I, I. I I always thought like I don't have much to offer, you know. Why would he ask to meet? But yeah, I have a plushie. <laughs> I have that. <laughs> well, and you had done a number of of comics that were talking about El Salvador yeah. during that time. So, yeah. um, was that just because El Salvador was in the news in the Bitcoin space, or what drew you to to start doing those? Yeah, I I did them because it made sense. So my comics take certain concepts around Bitcoin and I try to compress them and make them easy to understand. And when El Salvador adopted Bitcoin, just, you, I mean, the, the reactions you got from, from the media, for example, from the IMF, th those are comical in and on themselves. Like they were hilarious. And I basically just put them in comic form. That's all I did. It was a no brainer for me to do that because uh, the, like the things you would hear from the World Bank and then the IMF putting out a blog and like <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden they're very very concerned about El Salvador. Oh yeah, you know, oh, like no, they're yeah. this dominant world power. That's uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it just like it, it yeah it, it made sense to do that and so I did it and uh, obviously um, yeah it, it it's relatable because it's so stupid yeah and then that I think that is the first El Salvador comic I did where El Salvador. Um, adopts Bitcoin and then literally you would have people say yeah but that's just one small country like that doesn't even matter so it's just like it, the stories a lot of the times the stories write themselves so I did that and um, yeah that actually earned me the presidential follow which you know it's pretty cool yeah little door opener the little holder yeah <laughs> It's uh, I mean, you're you're living the Bitcoiners dream of being able to <laughs> be in a business that's directly related to Bitcoin. And, yeah. and like you said, you're not a technical person, but this is a way that you can do something that promotes Bitcoin that you know, doesn't require that. So. Yeah, I do you feel like I cheated sometimes. Like, how can you be how can you be working in the Bitcoin space? But, you know, you're not a software person or something, but it's it's happening more and more. People are finding ways to contribute and to get involved and that's that's amazing you know the more the, the space grows the more people find things they can do you can do a podcast you can write you can create some kind of content or you can even just get paid in bitcoin um, and just go from there and 
you know, most people, they start in their free time, they get involved. Like I get requests from people asking um, if they can support, if they can help translate my comics, for example. Um, and, you know, that's how you get started. And the more people we get in the space, the less, like the, the more non-technical people also you're going to have. And, you know, we need that. If everybody's technical, then how are you going to convey the, the, the narrative? So, uh, yeah. So is is this uh, is this an official model that's for sale or is this something? Yeah, that it is. Yeah, you so can people can go to the website and and buy. Yes. Buy the the El Salvador Bukele. Uh, El Little Hodler. Presidente. Okay. <laughs> you can actually. Get I, this I mean, I bet you would sell those out all throughout Latin America. It be, <laughs> seriously. I I should yeah I should like I I hope one day I can uh, make it more affordable to ship here or maybe even ship from here like I am. Like if if I have an option to bring some of, for example, my my manufacturing to um, a country that is Bitcoin friendly, I'm gonna do it right away. Like, <laughs> uh, I mean, there's definitely uh, factories here that produce those sorts of things. So yeah, it would be, yeah. Uh, so. I mean, I could see those if you had those in the gift shops in the airport. You, you wouldn't be able to keep them in stock here. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I, I love the merchandise here. When we went to Ataco, um, they, you know, they have all these little stores and they're selling all this handcraft and there were aprons with the uh, maple killer on them. There were mugs and then there were like little figurines <laughs> made of like ceramic that you can put on your windowsill or something. It's just crazy how popular the man is. Uh, I've never seen that before. And yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I, I don't, no, if you know, in my lifetime, I've seen that of any politician anywhere that has that kind of legitimate yeah. following. And why is that such a bad thing? Like, why is that portrayed as such a bad thing? You know, it's just it scares people. He's he's challenging the status quo. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. So, well, I am uh, hoping that uh, this will just be the the first trip of many for you to El Salvador. Maybe you uh, come back and uh, I hope so, try it on as a home. Um, I think you would find this is. I mean, this, if you're in the Bitcoin space, this is a great place to live because it's like a nonstop Bitcoin conference. You have <laughs> all the Bitcoiners really from around the world are passed through here at some point during the year, whether it's the Adopting Bitcoin conference or, you know, just at random times. And so mm -hmm. I think for people that are in the Bitcoin space, it's actually a very efficient place to live because you don't have to fly places for meetings. You just, yeah. the people come to you. Yeah. Um, that's part of the reason we decided to do the podcast. I never wanted to be a podcaster. It was nothing. But I was like, oh, but you're a natural. We have all these amazing people that are coming through here. It seems a shame that we don't, you know, <laughs> let them tell their stories. So, that's great. Um, so yeah. keep that in mind. Yeah. And I, I, I think you shouldn't um, go into it like, you, you shouldn't be naive about it. You shouldn't romanticize it. So I hear a lot of people say like, um, yeah, I'm thinking to move to El Salvador and then they've never been, right? So it you need to be kind of open and you need to be realistic about what expects you and what is expected of you. Um, that's what I feel. Like I can't just, like I, I can't recommend just saying, no, I'm just going to move down there, right? It might work, but it might also backfire if your expectations are completely different yeah. from what you well, get. Well, I mean, you're but... an avid traveler, so you you understand <laughs> all these things. Some people, you know, if you've never really traveled before and you move someplace and expect it to be like the place you're leaving, mm. you're going to be disappointed. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, but that said, for me, and I'm not, I'm not just saying that I really feel like a lot of things are aligned for me here. So for me personally, I I see little things that I would say are like, oh no, I I can't I can't live in a place in a place like this. So it's like I'm, so yeah, I am thinking I'm very much it. I'm 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 very much thinking about it now. Yeah. <laughs> well, we want to make sure that uh, the listeners and viewers can find where they can order their uh, little presidente uh, doll. So. <laughs> Do we have a screenshot from the from her website that we can we'll put it in the show notes. Okay. Okay. The littlehodler.com. Littlehodler.com? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then what about on Twitter? Where can people follow you? Oh yeah. So my Twitter is Lena and the very German last name. So it's uh Lena S E I C H E. Seiche, nobody can pronounce it because it's so German. It has all the German sounds. You need, you need to get a little hodler uh, Twitter yeah. handle. 
Oh I, yeah. Like, I know it's hard once you've built the following, you're like, oh, I wish I would have done it. This something that was easier. So yeah, yeah. No, somebody's squatting that handle. So <laughs> I can't I can't I can't use it. But you know, at some point, at some point I'll fix it. But yeah, so that's where you can find it. But also if you just Google Little Hodler or just search for Little Hodler on Twitter, I think I pop up. Okay. Um but yeah, one way or another you can find. So people can order these, you ship around the world. Yes, I do. And then you also do special stuff for there's companies out there that are looking to do merchandise yeah. or other promotional stuff. Yeah, so it's um, it's becoming... as long as they're Bitcoin companies, no, no shitcoiners. So. No, no, no shitcoins, please. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I do, uh, I do get requests to like make a hodler that hodls some kind of coin, which is just like no, it defeats the purpose. Like it doesn't, the message doesn't work anymore. And I get a lot of times people take my comics and then they Photoshop their coin <laughs> into it. <laughs> but you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, so it's um, a lot of companies, for them, it's like um, a little mascot, actually. So I don't know if you know about the Bitcoin Hotel. They do an amazing job at their, their marketing. They're so passionate about it. It's a little hotel in Germany, in the countryside. No, and, no I had not heard of that, yeah. Yeah, I think they've changed their handle to Bitcoin Hotel, too, okay. on Twitter. And um, it's like a family business. And the, the, the son, Mark is his name, he kind of took over and he pitched to them like, can I, can I Bitcoinize this? And they were like, sure. And over the last year and a half, it's become all Bitcoin. Like they obviously they accept Bitcoin. They have a little hodler suite, <laughs> like a little hodler room. Um, they make, do Bitcoin events. Um, they're in the media. They're in the German national media. Um, they've become extremely like in the German speaking space. Everybody knows them for for being the Bitcoin hotel, and they actually um, they made a little hodler using their you know their style. It's like a little princess hodler, and um, they've kind of adopted him as their their mascot. So he's everywhere now. Which I mean, for me that's amazing, and for them it's also great. So it's just you know everybody everybody wins. Yeah. I'm sure it's fun when you go to conferences or different things and you see people carrying those around. You know, it like, makes me mine. so happy. Yeah. <laughs> So if, if somebody wanted to have like one done for their company, what's what's like the minimum run to? to yeah. So I usually say everything, anything under 100 is just not affordable. Um, at 100 too, it's like economically speaking, it's probably not the smartest decision if you're going to if you're going to resell them unless you make it super uh, exclusive and then you resell at a high price. Yeah. But still, we do it from 100 and up. And then the higher you go, 210 is a very popular order amount. Um, then the higher you go, obviously, the, the better the rates get. But we get a lot of orders anywhere between 100 and 1,000. Yeah, that's the highest we get. Yeah. And is that like for a conference usually, if they're ordering 1,000? Um, yeah, what, let me see. Yeah, it was mostly conferences. And some big brands also ordered 1,000 before. Um, yeah, but let's see, you know, cause it's the bear market. Like I'm maybe, maybe in the bull market. This well, week. and that's what's, <laughs> what's so impressive. You've been able to keep this, this company going and it sounds like growing like through the, the bear market. And so, um, yeah, yeah. I think in the next run up, it's, I hope you're prepared. I hope you're, uh, you got your manufacturers ready to ramp things up. Oh yeah. They can't wait. They always ask him. <laughs> when can we make new when, ones like, when's the bull market yeah <laughs> i told them like are you gonna accept bitcoin anytime soon because i'm so tired of the bank wires such a hassle and antiquated like way of doing things yeah that's like one of it's the crazy. easiest ways yeah. to make people understand the value of bitcoin to make him do an international wire it's the and then worst. you don't know when it's going to show up i mean and then sometimes it gets flagged and held and you don't even know. They don't even tell you. And your supplier's like, hey, how come you didn't send the money? Like, no, I sent it. What? Oh. oh, horrible. And it goes to like three banks. And then when you ask your bank, like, where is it? I don't know. I gave it to that well, guy. They don't even know. And they don't even have like a confirmation number for you no. or anything. You're like, well, who has it? Well, we don't know. It's like this black box that it goes yeah. into. How is that a thing? I will never understand. It is. Yeah. It is crazy. So, so I have an idea. I think you need to have, you know, those... Um, those vending machines, those little crane machines yeah. that you can. I think we need to get some Bitcoin only ones with uh, full of little hodlers oh, there in El Salvador. Amazing. So that is amazing. 
keep, How have keep I not thought of that? That is so brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you'll have Bitcoiners willing to, to you know, spend some sats so they can have a chance to, to grab one of those. That is cool. Oh, so. we got to do that. <laughs> well, I love that you were able to make some time on your vacation to, to join us for this podcast. This has nice. been one of the most fun podcasts that, oh, that, I, that I've done. So. It's an honor. Um, it's so great. And yeah, as I was saying, when I got here, I'm just amazed at the way things are developing around here like i can see i just got here and i i just walked around the area and i can see things are happening i can like if you want to be somewhere where there's growth i like i like then no, it's like, a, like it's no, there's so much here. opportunity here yeah. there's all these you know the rest of the world's kind of shutting down and here like people are excited and they're looking ways to grow and build and so yeah it's a place for builders yeah, yeah, it feels like a secret tip, but like uh, uh, so underrated. Like, how is everybody not here now? <laughs> I sound like I'm such a shill for well, El Salvador. Well, it took, it took you a long it. time to to get here. I mean, it did. The, it, the president had to, you know, per, come personally invite you uh, and <laughs> visit in, in Turkey. And <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm glad yeah. you, you finally made it. Oh, me too. Me too. It's not going to be my last time. Yeah. Definitely not. Have you been surfing yet? I cannot like so I okay so a couple of years ago I did a, I visited a a wakeboard park in Phuket in Thailand and I just I parked there for a month and I just tried to learn wakeboarding it's my first time trying to stand on like a board I know it's not surfing right and I probably should have taken surf lessons instead because wakeboarding is like you know you have the, so there's like a trail and it's like water um then you have cables that pull uh -huh. you uh over that trail i've never done it like, with the cable i've done it behind a boat but i've never done i it, think but... that's better than the cable one okay. too right yeah so apparently that's where like the the world champions came to train and i just came down like i never stood on a surfboard so like how do i do this and they said yeah just kind of go and you hold on and then don't fall and i um that that traumatized me because the you're on a platform and then the the cable is like here and at some point it pulls you and you're bored and it pulls you with a force, pulls you forward, and you have to make sure you don't fall because if you fall flat on the water, that's very, very Stings painful. A little. Very painful. And I, I fell forward so many times, I lost count, and I actually got a, I, I got a concussion from it. So now I have like, like I, I have some like neck issues because of it. So that's my trauma from standing on a board. Since then, I have never tried it again. <laughs> you have to try surfing. It's uh, it's it's because I've done both, and yeah. and it's it's much different. You don't have yeah. you're not in that high speed, mm -hmm. especially when you're learning. So you'll it have looks to... cool. I saw some people try to surf today. I think the waves weren't ideal, um, but I still watched them, and it does. Well, the water's look... like. It's I think like eighty degrees. I mean, it's like Ooh, perfect. So yeah. it's uh, it's something you'll have to to try or maybe on your return trip when you move here yeah i think it's like it comes with the deal like if you if you live here you have to do the surfing yeah. like it's part of definitely. it <laughs> definitely paco learned how to surf well he was, he'd never surfed before so. Ooh, are you good now <laughs> okay like the, I, I don't know how you can stand on the board like that's my first question how do you how do you stand on it like <laughs> i think you'd be a natural you'll, you'll have to get out there <laughs> i want to try it <laughs> Well, thank you so much for uh, spending spending this uh, afternoon with us, and we will have to keep uh, shilling the, the little hodlers out there. Make sure all the Bitcoiners have them. Thank you so much. I had a great time. And we'll uh, have to we'll have to work on some ideas for a custom Bitcoin Beach one. So oh, I gotta have a little surfer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right well we will uh we'll follow up with you uh when you uh when you collect your stuff from turkey and make it back <laughs> sounds good <laughs>